What's going on, Ambitious Vet? Welcome to episode number 47 of the Ambitious Vet Show with U.S. Marine veteran, speaker, and founder of DH Beetle Consulting, Dave Beetle. Welcome to the Ambitious Vet, where we believe if you desire more, you have to become more. My name is Chris Hoffman, Marine Combat Veteran turned passion driven entrepreneur. On this show, I dive into the trenches with today's top military veteran thought leaders and influencers who know what it takes to not only pay the bills after the military, but really make an impact. They're going to share their breakdowns, their breakthroughs, and even their secret formulas for you to follow in your pursuit of living a life of passion and impact that will leave you empowered to take action on your next mission. All right, so if you're a listener that's been listening to us since day one, I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, you have no idea where this podcast started. I mean, we started back in 2016 where I used to interview some of these top military influencers, believe it or not, from my phone in my empty living room out here in San Diego, California, because, you know, I'm a simple country boy from St. Louis, Right, um, which means that it doesn't mean much, but it just means that I don't need to have fancy things. And sometimes you gotta go with almost nothing, with just a voice and a mission and a purpose to discover what actually does make a real impact in people's lives. And if you can start moving uh, people with just your own voice, sometimes you know that kind of tells more than just showing off fancy cars. And that's what we pride ourselves in inside the Ambitious Vet Network, our tribe, and even at our company, Vet Training and Coaching. So for those of you guys that have started since an empty living room with interviewing people from my cell phone, thank you very much. For those of you guys that are just getting started with this journey inside of desiring more, becoming more, as a veteran, we love to have you here. So guys, if you really do get along with um, this mission of disempowering ambitious veterans, right? With the insights, tools, and resources to execute their next mission and really leaving them in action to really live in a life of impact after the military, we'd love to partner up with you. We've built one of the largest online personal and professional development communities over the past two years and we're looking for people that want to help us go to the next level. We're looking for guests for the Passion Driven Tip of the Week, which is a 15 minute um, live, pretty much just subject matter expertise, solo Facebook live inside the tribe. So if that's you, definitely email me. My email will be in the show notes. Um, Also, if you want to be a guest on this podcast, email us with your media pack and kind of what your story is all about and why it aligns with the mission here. And we'd love to have you on the show. And lastly, if you want to be a sponsor and reach an audience in 10 countries, and actually we're reaching around 10 to 12,000 veterans on a weekly basis right now. And if you want to help align your brand, your business, right? And an audience that is desperately seeking out how to be peak performer out of the uniform, please email me in the email below. We'd love to have you. Without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into what's next. So I want to give a a, a huge shout out to Barry Englehart, who just left us a five-star review on iTunes. Barry, long story short, Midwestern boy, just like I am um, originally was one of the original founding listeners of this podcast and the Ambitious Vet Tribe and uh, believe it or not was one of the people that was making sure that this country boy from the Midwest sounded educated in his best-selling ebook 10 Steps to Predictic Success Out of the Uniform. So big shout out to Barry Englehart. He says, passion meets action. Chris often builds a tribe of diverse, successful, and insightful, ambitious veterans. He interviews subject matter experts and learns not only from their successes, but also their stumbles along the way. His willingness to be vulnerable, intermixed with his extreme passion towards servant leadership, makes him an excellent host and the common threat of sacrifice and pride instilled through his guests' diverse military and professional experiences creates a familiar and positive interaction as if eavesdropping on the most insightful friends talking at a cocktail party. 
Barry, I, I can't thank you enough, brother, from being from day one, one of the founding listeners of this podcast, the tribe, and even helping out, right, you know, edit the ebook and make it sound better, brother. Hat, hats go off to you, brother. I'm excited to have you actually on a guest uh, on this podcast um, here in a couple weeks, guys. And uh, if you're a listener right now that would like to go and leave a review, you're going to be shouted out next week. So guys, if you love what you're hearing, if you're finding golden grenades is what we call them here, go ahead and rate and review. That's how we reach more people, attract higher influential guests. So you not only um, continue to grow, but you become more, which is the name of the game here. Without further ado, let's go ahead and introduce today's guest. Today's guest is going to be Dave Beadle. Dave is the founder and principal of DH Beadle Consulting. As a military veteran, Dave is deeply passionate about the challenges faced by our servicemen and women who are making the transition from military to civilian life. After a successful career as a fitness and health innovator, Dave began working with transitioning veterans back in 2011 as a key stakeholder of an award-winning corporate integration program for a large telecommunications company out here in San Diego. Now, since 2016, Dave has been working with multiple nonprofits focusing on the special operations community, military families in transition, and individual veterans with coaching, networking, and career guidance, identifying a gap on the employer side of the transition process. Dave has founded DH Beetle Consulting to address the cultural mismatches that exist between the 1% who have served and the 99% who have not. He recognized He's recognized guys as a thought leader who not, is not only afraid to challenge conventional wisdom, but be a creative problem solver. Now, as an entrepreneur, he's helping employers and veterans to navigate the cultural divide together to ensure the fit happens intentionally, guys. I can't tell you enough how much I love his honesty around the gap that a lot of us don't normally think about, which is how do we, as veterans, not only get employed, but stay employed and constantly grow within an, uh, one organization, grow and impact and gain influence in one. And for employers out there, how do we retain highly performing and executing veterans out there that are just looking at how do we expand the mission and get shit done, guys? I'm excited to bring you guys more Golden Grenades on episode number 47 of the Ambitious Fet Show with Dave Beetle, let's go ahead and dive into the trenches. Let's get it. <laughs> Dave, are you there, brother? I am here, Chris. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> that was a mouthful, man, but I'm sure <laughs> I'm just hitting the cusp of who you are, who you are, brother. So go ahead and fill the gaps and let us know a little about who you who Dave is, man. Well, gosh, you know, those those were those were kind of like the big highlights, but uh, really my my journey has been uh, been a long one. Um, you know, when I was in the Marine Corps, uh, a whole bunch of you probably weren't even on the planet yet. Uh, so <laughs> I like to call myself the old Fort Marine when I get a chance to be introduced. So uh, but yeah, it's it's something that uh, is part of my DNA, like we all like to say. And really, this journey that I've been on over, gosh, now 39 years since I left the Marine Corps um, <laughs> is one that, uh, it, it, you know, I was talking to somebody just today and just, you couldn't script out. You couldn't plan how it all would go. But I love to be love to feel that I'm uniquely qualified for where I am now in life. So um, getting to where I am now and, and the kinds of things that, that I do in terms of serving this veteran community um, really is, I think, the culmination of all that, of all those, all those years and, uh, and getting to where I am today. So yeah, I just, uh, I'm here to serve and I, I'm fortunate and blessed enough to be able to do that, uh, in a number of different ways. And, uh, so I, I really appreciate being on the, on the telecast today or the telecast live Facebook live today and, uh, look <laughs> forward live, to our conversation. <laughs> yeah, we're live, man. Yeah, baby, it's showtime. Um, so yeah, so I, I love it. And I mean, being someone that's, you know, served in the corporate world for 20 years, served in the core, and um, has even served in some of the, the largest organizations as far as military empowerment, employment, um, you know, organizations out here in San Diego, such as the Honor Foundation and 
um, a couple others. I mean, you you really have done the legwork and kind of know what you're talking about a little bit. So let's go ahead and dive into the, the trenches, Dave. So tell us a little sure. about your transition um, and how different it was back in the 1980s, back in the old far days, as you would describe it. And um, how different it is now in the 21st century and kind of what are the different challenges that we face in the 21st century? Oh, out? my goodness. It's it's night and day. So today, right, <laughs> everybody coming out today has numerous, numerous advantages that they need to avail themselves of. You've got, first of all, mandatory programs once you're exiting the military, um, whatever it's called, uh, TRS, TGPS, whatever. I know five days of your life, you'll never get back, but at least it's something there, right? <laughs> then once you get out or you're in that transition process, you've made the decision to leave. There's 45,000 organizations, veteran service organizations that are registered today with the IRS to help you and your families do that. We've got a grateful nation. They're all, you know, every time you turn around, they're thanking you for your service. So I came out in 1980. Now, 1980 was post-Vietnam. I did not serve in any kind of a, a hostile zone. There was no combat actions or anything like that going on at the time that I served, but I was still lumped in with the kind of the Vietnam era veteran. And as you recall from, from history and for those of you that have lived it, um, the nation wasn't quite as grateful for military service at that time. I was the only person from my high school actually who, who uh, entered the, the military after, uh, right after high school. So when I got, when I got out, there was nothing there were no transition programs whatsoever. Mm. What I got, and this is, I vividly remember this, my last day of the Corps, I was handed a paper brochure and it was one of those trifold paper brochures, right? And on the front cover was a cartoon. It had a picture of five guys sitting in front of a storefront, just kind of lazing around, hanging back. They're all wearing the same civilian clothes. And the caption underneath that cartoon was, so you want to get out to be an individual? Question mark, question mark. That was it. <laughs> basically shown the door. Don't let it hit your ass on the, on, in your ass on the way out. Mm. So there was, there was nothing in terms of transition support. So I had to figure it out. Now, like I said, I didn't have to go through any of the stuff that veterans in this century literally have had to go through, but I still had problems with the adjustment. So I went right from high school to Marine Corps, then to college, very different environments. Um, I struggled when I was first in college, especially the first three months I was there. Um, people, it was this whole idea of people didn't get me. I didn't get them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. it took me a while to kind of get my head straight. And as I look back over the number of years of transition that have happened since then, like, oh my gosh. I got to the point where, well, I spent literally the whole decade of the 80s in college um, trying to figure out kind of what I was, what I was gonna do. Yeah. And then um, <laughs> and as I was working after college, I kept running into so many misperceptions from people when I would tell them about my military experience that I literally took my military service off of my resume. Wow. Because I just, it just set the stage up literally for failure because of the preconceived notions that people have with, as to how I would act in certain situations. Yeah. Got to say, I didn't do myself any favors in a, in, in a number of cases. And yeah, I got fired a lot. Yeah. So I, I tell people in the networking classes that, that I teach that, you know, none of this stuff has changed since the eighties and nineties. It's just, we got different technology and I got really good at it because I got fired a lot because I still didn't know what the heck I was doing and yeah. where I fit. It was still a struggle. Oh man, that's, that's, that. I mean, I think anybody watching this live or watching this later, listening this on the podcast around the world, all of us can relate to that. Um, I, I mean, just for me, uniquely, um, me, I, I got, I, I was lucky enough to walk right into a, the largest commercial fitness gym um, the day after I got out of the Marine Corps, honorably discharged and um, spent a year there, but I wound up getting fired because I wasn't a cultural fit. Um and I was one of the top salespeople and all that kind of stuff, but I, I definitely get it. And you almost feel like you're broken. Like you almost have to go back in to, yeah. to feel like you're, you, you, you fit in a little bit. Right. So I can, I think there's a lot of people that can relate to that. So um, how did you find identity? How did you start figuring it out? Because it sounds like you spent a lot of time gaining a lot of formal knowledge, gaining insights around um, what Dave could potentially be passionate about, but what was, how did you start discovering what your purpose, what, what, what you were here for after the Marine Corps? 
Yeah, well, you're right, Chris, really. It, it took time. It did take a lot of time, and it's, it's evolved. In, in all honesty, over, over the years, it's definitely evolved. So, like I said, I spent the decade of the 80s in college and um, sort of struggled to kind of find what, what it is that I really wanted to do. One of the reasons I went in the Marine Corps in the first place because I didn't see a purpose in, in going to college. So when I got there, yeah, I figured, okay, I'm going to be an engineer. That's great. Um, my dad was an engineer. My grandfather was an engineer. They didn't pass that engineering gene down to me. So <laughs> I literally, I literally flunked out of, uh, nearly flunked out of college my first year and a half there. So I struggled to kind of figure out where it was and then um, ended up getting, getting another degree business and marketing. But then I finally stumbled on this thing. It's funny. You mentioned we, we had this conversation when we first met. But I stumbled on health and fitness, and I was never a really sports guy. I was the classic ninety-eight pound weakling when I went into uh, into Marine Corps boot camp. <laughs> but there was something about fitness and something about helping other people realize what they could do with their bodies and how that would help them be better. That really started to seem like something like a purpose. Now at the time, I really didn't know what to call it. That's why I say it's, it's evolved over time. And, and, you know, when you look over the intervening years, I look back at a lot of the things that I did as jobs that, that, like I said, got fired from. Most of those times when I didn't find anything that I had any kind of purpose with and really was kind of all around serving, I've learned, that the job was, was uninspiring. The work was uninspiring. Sure, I'd give it my best shot, but then I'd always at some point in time end up, like I said, either shooting, shooting myself on the foot. So... They let me go or just was not, I needed to get out of there. So yeah. over time, it, it really evolved to this idea of service. I want to be of service. And when I left my, my last employer, large company here locally, uh, me and 1400, my closest friends were told in 2015 that our services were no longer required. <laughs> um, <laughs> woo. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it was it was a great ride for, for about 19 years. Yeah. Um, I had to figure out what the heck to do next. And mm -hmm. one of the, when I was, I'd gotten, like I said, into, into some of the military transition um, support services within that company. And I was finding things outside of it that really resonated with that. And I said, man, I feel like I'm, I'm reconnecting with something. Like I said, I took my military service off of my resume for most of my career. Now I was reconnecting with that. And after 30 plus years, that connection was still there, mm, which was just yeah. amazing to me. And, and I've come to evolve my purpose now and, and my why. If you're familiar with Simon Sinek and his whole aspect of finding your why, yeah. mine really is this, and I, I posted it on the Facebook page yesterday, is to change the trajectory of a life so that the misfits can conduct their own symphony. And when I say misfits, guys like me who can't find where you fit. And I really enjoy showing them either personally through a coaching relationship or within the environments that they interact in how they can find that fit so they then can soar by creating their own symphony. So that's where I, that's where I sit right now with purpose. That's awesome. No, I, I love that because there is like Uncle Sam's misguided children. You ever heard of that with the Marine Corps? I mean, <laughs> yes. we really do. We really do get out there and we want to perform and execute and crack these dark humor jokes. But sometimes, you know, people just don't necessarily grab onto them. So I think sometimes being able to fill that gap and and um, how do you how do you integrate and do a brand new culture of people that are are saying feeling words? I remember that was the biggest thing that I was struggling with was saying, you know, I feel this way. You know, when you say you feel a certain way in the Marine Corps, you were told you were a weak body or a shit bag or whatever it may be. So um, it, it really is filling a big gap on how do you help people get into organizations and stay there and continue to thrive and grow. And it is one of the biggest costs inside of organizations, isn't it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so great. So, I mean, it sounds like your biggest failure. I mean, that was one of our questions that we're going to cover was literally getting laid off of one of the biggest telecommunication companies out here. But I mean, one cool thing that you did inside the organization, didn't you build out, um, a military, um, growth or, you know, kind of program inside this telecommunications, uh, company? Yeah. Yeah, I was I was fortunate enough to be a key stakeholder in that that program, and a, and a good friend of mine, um, Jerry Borgia, was the architect of that program, and yeah. it started out with something that they had originally crafted um, that was working with disadvantaged youth in the community, and the idea was you bring a veteran in 
and it could be whether they were in transition or, or still serving, still active duty or veteran, bring them into the organization. We gave them a job that was commensurate with their skill set. And they had this job as kind of like an internship experience for over eight weeks. They'd come in four hours a day, five days a week, work at that job. And then on the fifth day of the week, we exposed them to basically a year's worth of professional development education courses. In addition to resume writing, interviewing skills, we did strength finders assessment, disc assessments. They had access to all of our recruiters, um, yeah. took them on events. And a key component of that program was we partnered each of the veterans, each of the uh, fellows coming through the program with a mentor. And that mentor had to be an employee of the company for at least a year. And they also had to be a military veteran. So that's how I started with it. I started as one of the original mentors. And we were really the river guides. We were the ones there to show the ropes and what were these weird things that happened in this company. And, and remember, this company was a, a high tech telecommunications company with a vastly different environment and culture from what any branch of the service were, were coming into. Uh, one of the stories that I love to tell that, that shows you how different this can be is, is the, uh, the story of put yourself in the position of a, of a veteran who's just newly been hired with this company. It's got 40 some odd buildings scattered over five square miles. And you've been there like two weeks and you've given an opportunity to go to your first meeting. The meeting's at 10 o'clock in the morning. So as a veteran, as a Marine Corps veteran, what time are you going to show up at that meeting? Oh, man, 15 minutes early. 15 minutes early at least. Right. Okay, yeah, exactly. All right. Well, unbeknownst to you, there's a cultural norm within this organization that says everybody, and I mean everybody, will show up at least 10 minutes late to every meeting that's scheduled. So if you're there 15 minutes early, you're cool in your jets for 25 minutes waiting for other people to show up. You're new to the company, figure, okay, did I get the wrong conference room? Uh, you know, are they messing with me here? How they, oh, yeah. dare they disrespect me? By the time people do, do start dribbling in 10 minutes after the hour, what kind of a mood are you gonna be in? You're gonna be stewing. And you're going to be putting in, putting yourself in an environment where if you ask you your opinion about what we should do, and you're going to say in typical Marine Corps fashion, well, this is what we should do. I think we should do this now. You guys don't need to do I know exactly what, that's not going to fly. That wouldn't fly in the best of circumstances. But now you're all pissed off because you feel disrespected. And the norm, again, in that organization is, well, you have to socialize these ideas. You have to bring them up and let everybody talk about it. But you're coming in there hard charging Marine, knocking down the doors, getting things done. <laughs> that's going to set you up immediately for failure. And you're going to be labeled as not a team player right from the get go. Mm. So those are the kinds of things that you can experience within a company that, and this is what we tried to help those people do when we were the mentors is find out what these nuances were mm. and help them get prepared for them at the very least. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I can definitely identify that coming out of a major corporation out here as a sales trainer. I mean, one of the biggest things, my biggest feedback in all my performance reviews were, you know, Chris, I, you know, you don't always have to have all the answers. You don't have to take on the entire mission of the company. And I was, I was one of those guys, I was hard charging Marine that would find things that are missing inside the company. And I try to bring it into things. And it just, at the end of the day, it, it diminished other leaders inside different departments of companies. And I was trying to lead the way. And ultimately I was, I was causing confliction inside the mission completion and all that kind of stuff. So that was one of the biggest things I learned in my experience of being a sales trainer in the organization was sometimes, you know, the best, the best leaders are the ones that bring other people up and have them supply the answers. And you kind of just lead conversations from other people's you know, point yeah. of views and stuff like that. I mean, it's sometimes the guy that's always trying to lead the way that burns out and uh, necessarily can't always sustain it all the time. So um, that's yeah. that's a yeah. really good point. Really good point. So um, I want to dive into this thing because I, you know, one of the cool things I, you know, I found when I was researching you and one of the things that we've even established in our beginning of our relationship, Dave, is this difference between veteran friendly companies and veteran focused organizations. Tell us more about this and um, kind of what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so this was this was something that really started to dawn on me um, when I was uh, talking with organizations through uh, my work with the Honor Foundation and elsewhere, and also listening to and reading a lot of comments that veterans were posting on places like LinkedIn and, and other, other um, avenues. So there's a lot of companies out there that really have their heart in the right place, right? They want to hire veterans. 
and everybody calls themselves veteran friendly. But a lot of the veteran community feels that this is just lip service. And because and I was trying to figure out, well, why is that? Well, it's their experiences they've had with them, um, either directly because the recruiting experience has been poor. Uh, they go to a job fair. Typically, these the, the companies that are what I call veteran friendly, which is really at the bottom of the scale of veteran focused. I have four levels on a scale that I created. So veteran friendly to me is those companies that essentially are basically giving lip service to it. They send their junior recruiters to the job fairs. They don't know diddly squat about how to translate a military resume or how to talk to veterans or service members about what they bring to the table, right? Send yeah. it to the bottom of the barrel. The junior, most junior people, the least skilled, the least uh, engaging, oftentimes they don't even know how to react at, the, at a job fair. You look at their website and they've got the, the career section on a website and you see some guy who's got a goatee like me with his collar buttoned up like this, um, all completely out of uniform with hair longer than, than you or I have. And say, oh yeah, that's a, that's not a guy in uniform. You know, completely weird stock photos that, that have no relationship to real folks in, in uniform. Um, and they, like I said, maybe they've got their heart in the right place hmm. and they're reaching out, well, we want to hire a bunch of veterans, but they really don't even know how to do it. They don't know where to find them. Um, once they get them, they don't know what to do with them. So that's kind of like the first level. And those are, those are the ones that I'm targeting. This is, you know, if, if you're here, you need help. And if you're really sincere about what you want to do for veterans, let me help you move up the scale. So the next one up the scale is, is what I call veteran familiar and veteran familiar is oftentimes think of it as the easy button for veterans. Uh, this was very common when I was dealing with the special operations community, the contractors, um, basically they could hit the easy button, jump into a contracting job and they're, they're stepping out of the uniform, out of the teams one day and hopping on a plane, going back in country the next day, but wearing civvies instead, you know, they, they really haven't changed the job. A lot of the defense contractors in general, just for more uh, conventional forces, veteran, very veteran heavy population. So there's not a lot of differences in the culture, not a lot of differences in the way they do things. You're working with customers and people that, that, you, that you're familiar with. Okay, so that's, that's a comfortable environment a lot of veterans go into. Then the next one up is what I call veteran ready. Now, these are companies who have made some strides, right? They're getting a little bit more engaged in terms of, of trying to seek out veterans. Maybe they're uh, starting to leverage some of the veterans they already have within their organization to help them source people. Um, you know, maybe they're doing some things in the community a little bit to help recognize that. Still, the recruiters might need some work, but they're starting to understand a bit more. They might uh, partner with some of these organizations that are out there, the VSOs that are out there. And then the top level is really the ones that I like to see companies aspire to. And this is the veteran focused. These are the companies that realize in order to get the most benefit from their hiring initiatives, and remember, businesses always have to have a business case to do something, whether it's altruistic or not, there's always a business case. If you want to maximize that ROI, you need to do the right things to ensure veterans will be successful within their environment. So they've thought about and put together an onboarding and retention program that's specific to the needs of veterans. They've got opportunities for veterans to seek out mentors, those who have walked the, the same path that they're going to walk and help them with those nuances of culture that we've already talked about. They are uh, training their recruiters and other folks and hiring managers how to actually translate the, the skill sets that veterans bring, whether it's on the resume or in the conversations that they have during interviews. And they value the veterans and our understanding of what the veterans need to see in terms of feedback and progression and understanding in order to that for them to feel committed to and more importantly finding a purpose within that job whether it's the work itself or what the company is doing in the community that the veteran then can find and latch on to as their sense of purpose and meaning yeah that's awesome i love that and you've you've broken that all out huh yeah you yeah. got that all broken down that's amazing and that's come from how many years of experience on um just formulating this whole thing Gosh, you know, I've been I've been doing the veterans transition stuff like you know, like I said in the beginning since 2011. So a lot of this stuff's kind of been percolating in yeah. the head, and then when it, you start thinking about how do I communicate this to people, um, really in the last like two years is what I've been really focused awesome. on. How can I make yeah. this make sense to other people? Yeah, concepts. <laughs> it sounds like you've yeah, created exactly. a pretty awesome one. Yeah, it's a great. It sounds like it's amazing, and. Um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, how can employers play a role in veterans transition? How can they be more proactive 
and implementing like more veteran focused approaches and stuff like that. Dave, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, like I said, this every every business is going to have a business case for it, and you can make a really strong business case for veterans. That ROI to them is important. The turnover really is the thing that that's that's problematic for a lot of organizations that have gone down this road of, of wanting to bring veterans in. That has a cost. It's ninety to two hundred percent of the annual salary for that role to to replace it to backfill it. So uh, you can see that there's a pretty high cost for even one person that they lose. 45% of service members will leave their first post-service job within one year. 65% will leave that job within two years. Now, the, the employers then need to understand what causes this. And I've basically broken it down into four mismatches. It's a cultural mismatch, a skills mismatch, an expectations mismatch, or a purpose mismatch. Anyone or any combination of those will cause the veterans to feel undervalued, underutilized, misunderstood, a misfit, and they will leave. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of the biggest things we desired even joining the uniform. I I know that was one of the reasons why I joined was I wanted to belong to something bigger than, than what I was, which I was like an alcoholic, a college party boy that was going nowhere fast in a small town in St. Louis. So I, I think just like, being able to feel like they belong to something is, is, is something that they're looking for. So I love, I love that you're getting down to the nuts and bolts and, and really the practical knowledge of what is missing inside the, the employee um, employees role inside of veterans, being able to not only get in organizations and thrive because another stat that we shared, even in our first coffee meeting that we had out here in San Diego is, is for over 45% of veterans leave because it's not challenging enough, right? Which definitely yeah. dives into the whole purpose role on things and and um, helping them feel like they're challenged. And, you know, one of the best things I've learned, even being a mid-level manager for the last corporation I worked in, is you've got to give them responsibility quick. You know, they they grow in that. They'll 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 take feedback easier and stuff like that when you give them responsibility on stuff because we're inherent we're inherently in our DNA leaders. So um, we got a tradition here. I know we're, we're hitting shorter time, Dave. What is the yeah. three golden grenades that you would drop in here for any ambitious vet inside this tribe to make immediate impact in their next mission today? Yeah, yeah, those, that's a great question. I love this one and I thought a lot about it. So uh, first I'd say purpose. That's, that's a no-brainer, right? But take the time to find it. Like I said, my journey was a long time. I didn't even to call it for a long time. Take the time to find it. Organizations like the Honor Foundation and other transition institutions, Honor Foundation in particular, they spend five weeks peeling back the onion to help these guys figure out their next mission in life. So take the time to find the purpose because it's going to be important. It's going to resonate throughout the entire journey. Next thing, transition is a process. It's ongoing. I said, I've been, I've been out of the Marine Corps 39 years, but I have transitioned multiple, multiple times, and I'm still transitioning even today. And as I look back on that transition journey, I can see milestones along that pathway that still resonate with me today. So it's a process, it's ongoing, embrace it, understand it. And, for, and finally, it's never too late. You know, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. Like I said, <laughs> I've, been, I've been out of this a long time, but here I am at 60, you know, something years old, starting my, starting my own company. <laughs> and really looking forward to and enjoying the journey. So it's never, ever too late on any of these things. Yeah, that's awesome. I, lo- I love I love the fact of always be looking for self-improvement. Always be looking to get 1% better every single day. Um, and just like Dave said, it's never too late, ambitious vets. If you're someone that's just running and gunning, 24 years old, getting out of the uniform, or if you're uh, someone that's getting out 25, 30 years out, it's never too late to get out and so continue to chase a mission that's bigger than yourself, guys. Um, Dave, I mean, where can we go to find you? I know you got a giveaway for the Ambitious yeah. Vet Tribe. So if you want to go ahead and give that away to any employer that's looking to take on veterans, keep retention high inside their organizations, what is the gift and how can we find you, Dave? Yeah. So first of all, let me talk about the gift. What I'm offering is for any employer, and that's any ambitious vet who's an employer, or if you are uh, employed by an organization that could be useful, I'm going to uh, offer a free assessment to see where you are on that veteran-friendly to veteran-focused scale. 
Come on. That leads into potential opportunities for you to say, how can we improve? So all you need to do if you're interested in that is reach out to me. You can connect to, with me on LinkedIn. So it's DH Beetle. Just find my LinkedIn profile. Um, let me know you saw it. Uh, you found me or heard about me through the Ambitious Vet website or Facebook Live. The other thing is sign up for my newsletter. I do a monthly newsletter. Um, you can uh, sign up for that by sending an email to info at dhbeetleconsulting.com. And uh, that's the, those are the, those are the easiest way to get a hold of me. Awesome. Yeah. And Ambitious Vets, all those links will be right in the comments below as well. So Dave, we'll take care of that for you. I think that's an amazing gift. I mean, think about it, Ambitious Vet. If you're here at a, a small business looking to take on more veterans or even a mid, mid-size or large company, I think even shifting the mindset on how do we get veteran focus? How do we not be the, the veteran friendly and win hearts and minds, but really how do we help veterans get onboarded and stay in our organizations? Because I think another stat that we read recently that over 60% I think it was a Syracuse um, research data point that I read two weeks ago was that veterans are 65% more probable to become becoming promoted quicker than their civilian counterparts inside of organizations. So um, if you want productivity, you want to increase your revenue, um, I suggest at least taking the assessment. I think there's very low risk in that and figuring out where you rank and becoming veteran focused and keeping high performing veterans employed and making your company and culture better. So Dave, I just want to acknowledge you, brother, for being on the Ambitious Vet, man. I mean, who you are as the old fart Marine or whatever, however you want to call it, man. I mean, thanks for coming in here because, I mean, you you spent 19 years in, in corporate world and uh, you could easily pack up your utility belt and just go travel the world, which you still are, but you're still making that time to empower veterans inside of organizations. For that, I really thank you. Thank you My for pleasure. being on the show. So, well, there you have it, Ambitious Vets. Episode number 47 of the Ambitious Vet Show with Dave Beadle. Well, one of the biggest golden grenades I got out of this episode, and I'm excited to hear from a few of you, either in the Facebook tribe or via email, what yours was. But the key one I got is transition is a process. You heard straight from the horse's mouth, from the old fart Marine, as Dave said, getting out back in the 1980s, that he spent a decade figuring it out. Guys, don't try to get the transition right. Just figure out how do you get 1% better and find the organization that's veteran focused, not veteran friendly. Guys, as always, subscribe, rate, review the podcast. Feedback is what allows anything to improve in life. We want to improve right beside you. So meet us in the middle and let's get better together. Sound good? Lastly, we know that you guys are warrior made, but to become passion driven, just utilize this one golden grenade you heard today and you will find your life being more meaningful. Let's go get it, Ambitious Vet.